Seed germination. Seed germination is the growth and development of a seed. This is a seed into a seedling. That is the development of a seed into a seedling. The emergence of the radical through the seed coat marks the end of germination. So from the seed up to the emergence of the radical, that marks the process of germination. There are certain conditions that are necessary for germination to take place. These are internal and external conditions. The internal conditions include one presence of enzymes. Enzymes control many processes involved in germination. These processes include hydrolysis of food reserves to provide nutrients for growth. Remember the seed has food storage structures such as cotyledons and the endosperm. So the food reserves are hydrolyzed into soluble forms that can be made use by the growing regions. For example, starch is broken into sugars by the enzyme amylase, while lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol by the enzyme lipase. Another role of enzymes is in respiration. Through respiration, energy is released for the process of growth. Synthesis of new cellular materials, such as organelles, also require the presence of enzymes because many of the reactions are enzymes controlled. Another internal factor that is necessary for germination is the presence of hormones. There are various hormones that promote growth and neutralize the effect of inhibitors. This includes gibberellins. The hormones gibberellins promote growth and also neutralize the effect of the chemical inhibitors. And then viable embryos. That is, the embryos must be living for it to continue developing into a plant. So if the embryo is dead, then the seed will not germinate. Then there are external conditions necessary for germination to take place. These external conditions include water. Water has several roles during germinations and this include activation of enzymes, hydrolysis of stored food reserves because hydrolysis involves the use of water to break down complex molecules into simpler ones. Water also acts as a solvent and a transport medium for the nutrients. Water provides the medium in which all the biochemical reactions take place. Water also softens the seed coat to allow for the rupturing and emergence of the radical. And water plays a role in cell elongation through the vacualization process, that is formation of vacuoles. So as water gets into the cells, vacuoles form, causing the expansion of the cells, and this is what brings about cell elongation, which contributes to the overall growth of the cell. Another external factor that is necessary for germination is presence of oxygen. Oxygen is required for aerobic respiration, which provides energy for growth. Optimum temperature is another factor. Germinations involve many reactions such as respiration and hydrolysis that are enzyme controlled. The optimum temperature depends on the natural habitat of the plant. In most seeds, the optimum temperature ranges between 30 degrees C to 35. 
This provides the optimum temperature for the, for example, respiratory enzymes, which contribute to the breakdown of sugars to release energy for the process of germination. Very low temperature in, inactivates the enzymes, while if the temperatures are beyond the optimum, then the enzymes are denatured. So optimum temperature is very important for the process of germination to take place. Now, we cannot turn to the actual process of germination. Now, the process begins with the intake of water by the seed, mainly through the micropyle. So water gets in. And this process is known as imbibition. That is the intake of water into the seed. This intake of water leads to swelling of the endosperm and cotyledons, resulting in rupturing of the seed coat. The water also activates the hydrolytic enzymes and other, other enzymes. The entrance of water will also lead to activation of the embryo so that it releases the hormones gibberellic acid. The gibberellic acid, then in, for example, this is a maize grain, there's a layer known as the aluron layer that is rich in proteins. The gibberellins from the embryo will stimulate formation of enzymes from this aluron layer. And then these enzymes like amylase will then catalyze the hydrolysis of food reserves such as starch into sugars. So the food reserves in the endosperm and also the cotyledon are broken down into soluble forms that are transported to the growing centers of the primule and the radical. So the sugars Amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol are transported to these growing regions, and this leads to the growth of the primule and the radical. So at the growing centers, the nutrients are used for respiration to provide energy and synthesis of new cellular materials. The radical is the first one to emerge during germination through the micropyle. It grows downwards into the soil for anchorage and absorption of water and minerals. The primule then emerges and grows upward towards light. This, so as all this growth is taking place, if the dry weight of the germinating seed is to be plotted against time, there will be an initial decrease in the dry mass of the developing plant. The initial decrease is brought about by hydrolysis of food reserves, mainly the starch in the storage centers such as the endosperm. The oxidation of the sugars produces carbon for oxide and water. So during oxidation, say if it is the sugars, Sugars are broken down into carbon four oxide, water, and energy. Now, the carbon four oxide is lost as a gas and has a greater mass than the oxygen that was taken during aerobic respiration. Water does not contribute to the dry mass. So, when, with this CO2 being lost, water is excluded in the dry mass, you find that there is a loss in the dry mass as germination continues. And this will continue until the seedling produces green leaves and starts to make its own food. So this initial loss here is because of the continuing respiration in which carbon four oxide is lost as a gas after the sugar has been respired or oxidized and then the water is excluded from the dry mass. 
This loss continues until such a point that the plant has formed leaves and is able to make its own food. Then there's going to be a, an increase as the rate of respiration is lower than the rate of synthesis of new materials. So there are two types of germination in plants. Two types of germinations in plants. And this depends on whether the cotyledons are brought above the ground or remain below it. The first type is known as the epigeal germination. Epigeal germination. In this type of germination, the cotyledon is carried up and out of the soil, forming the first photosynthesis structure of the plant. It is brought about by the rapid elongation of the hypocotyl. So, for example, in the common bean, here the cotyledons have been brought above the soil, and this comes about because of the rapid elongation of the hypocotyl. Hypocotyl, if you look at the structure of the dicotyledonous seed, the hypocotyl is this region here between the radical and the cotyl that connects the embryo to the cotyledon. Now this part here elongates rapidly and as it elongates rapidly, it carries the cotyl and the cotyledons and the plumule together the epicotyl out of the soil. So this is here, if you look at this diagram, the hypocotyl, which forms a hook that pushes through the soil, protecting the plumule and the cotyledons. Once out of the soil and exposed to light, exposure to light, the hypocotyl straightens out and the cotyledons separate, begin to separate, exposing the plumule. The cotyledons develop chlorophyll and becomes photosynthetic. The plumule then grows into the first foliage leaves, which start photosynthesizing. So these are the first foliage leaves that carry out the process of photosynthesis. The cotyledons then wither and fall off. So as mentioned, epigeal germination occurs in plants such as the common beans, Phaseolus vulgaris, and also the sunflower. What brings about the epigeal germination is a rapid elongation of the hypocotyl. And as it elongates from this seed here, it will push all the structures above it, the cotyl, the epicotyl, the cotyledons, and the plumule out of the soil. The second type of germination is known as hypogeal germination. Now, in hypogeal germination, for example, in the maize grain, it is the epicotyl, this is the epicotyl, the region between the plumule and the cotyl that elongates rapidly. So, in the maize, the plumule is protected by the coleoptile. The co coleoptile together with the plumule grow toward light. So when under the soil, there was the coleoptile growing out towards light and away from gravity. So by growing towards light, the coleoptile shows positive phototropism while by growing away from gravity, it shows negative geotropism. So the plumule inside the coleoptile grow out through the pericarp. Remember the, the, the maize grain wall consists of the pericarp and the seed coat. So the coleoptile and the plumule grow out of the pericarp and out of the soil. That once out of the ground and is exposed to light, the coleoptile ruptures and the leaves, that is the plumule, grow out to start photosynthesis. They form the first foliage leaves and they carry out photosynthesis. 
Now, because of the faster elongation of the epicotyl, the cotyledons remain in the ground, absorbing nutrients from the endosperm and transmitting them to the growing centers of the primul and the radical. So here, if you look at this diagram, the epicotyl elongates fast. And as it elongates very fast, it pushes the coleoptile and the primal out of the seed coat and the pericarp, like that, into or out through the soil. So this elongates and you have this growth taking place. And that's how the coleoptile grows out of the soil. Hypocotyl is also growing, but not as rapidly as a epicotyl. So because of the rapid elongation of the epicotyl, the cotyledon, the endosperm, are left below the ground. While once the coleoptile comes out of the ground and is exposed to light, it ruptures, thereby exposing the primal that grow to form the fast foliage leaves that carry out photosynthesis.